steel cage hurtles into the earth, dropping at an exhilarating 50 feet per second. In 10 minutes, the passengers have descended two miles beneath the surface. This is the latest incarnation of a grand obsession, the hunt for gold. The South African deep mines are the richest gold mines in the world today, and the most treacherous. The natural temperature is 128 degrees. Air conditioning lowers that to a balmy 96. Subterranean reservoirs can dump 1,000 gallons of water an hour into a tunnel, resulting in stifling 100% humidity. Tunneling more than two miles deep pushes natural forces to the limit. Despite the best precautions that modern science can devise, these men encounter deadly risks that cannot be predicted or prevented. In the very deep mines, there's a tremendous force on the rock to enter the empty space. And the day I first arrived in South Africa to go into one of the deep mines, three men were killed in that mine as I approached it. They'd been working. They had no notion that anything was wrong, and there wasn't anything wrong except they were working in a deep mine, and the rock burst is like a machine gun. Spontaneous rock explosions are but one obstacle in man's enduring quest for the yellow metal. There is something about gold. If somebody says there's gold and it's free for the taking, thousands of people will uproot their lives to chase it. Like volcanic lava, gold was once contained deep beneath the earth. A metallic element, it ascends as superheated vapor, which mixes with other metals as the steam cools. Over millions of years, it slowly rises near the surface and within the sight of men. Heavy, lustrous, nearly indestructible, it has long symbolized power, wealth, and love. Archaeological digs of ancient societies have unearthed gold jewelry and coins from all corners of the globe. In recent years, excavations in Bulgaria have uncovered the earliest known treasure, a 6,000-year-old cache of solid gold sculptures. The discovery revealed an ancient ability to both mine and purify metals. Objects that were found in Bulgaria had been processed through a smelting circuit of some kind that told us that these people knew how to clean up the iron, the tin, and the other impurities in gold ore so that they could end up with a gold-colored, malleable gold that could be cast into delicate objects. Gold mining and craftsmanship reached new sophistication with the Egyptians of 2900 BC. Using the same persistence and forced labor that built the pyramids, they dug the first underground mines with shafts up to 300 feet deep. The Egyptians heated cave walls with fire and followed that by a dousing of cold water that created fissures. Those cracks were then ripped open by picks. They used sodium chloride, salt, to separate gold from lesser metals. The solution attracts silver, pulling it away from the gold. Egyptians worshipped gold as the incarnation of the sun god and used it to sanctify their most sacred rituals. When the tomb of the pharaoh Tutankhamun was unearthed in 1922, the boy king lay surrounded by a magnificent array of golden artifacts. From the sarcophagus to the solid gold death mask, the object shone just as brightly as on the day he died.
3,500 years before. Among native peoples of the Americas, the most advanced gold work came from the Moche of Peru. By 500 AD, they were dipping copper in a dissolved solution of gold, creating an early form of gold plating. By 1000 AD, gold mining was common in the Americas. Mayans used gold to create elaborate ceremonial objects, like this breast ornament. In Mexico, Aztec markets sold exquisite wares crafted by goldsmiths. Europeans of the Middle Ages believed that gold had spiritual powers. For a thousand years, alchemists pursued a mystical vision that said he who transformed lead into gold would convert sin into virtue. The alchemists were very serious investigators trying to convert lead into silver, copper into gold, and they, they passed this on from father to son. It went in many of the large cities in Europe. There were teachers of alchemistry in the universities. It was very serious indeed. Eventually realizing that only natural forces can create gold, scientists turned their attention to improving mining techniques. Ore had traditionally been lifted to the surface by hand-operated windlasses. They gave way to the first widespread use of horses underground. There were animals of burden that could pull all these ore cars to a shaft where it could be raised to the surface where they could extract the gold. These horses lived underground, literally. There were stables underground. They never went to the surface unless they were injured or getting old. In Europe, ambitious large-scale projects harnessed powerful sources of energy. The Germans were very clever in the Middle Ages, building ponds up to eight miles away from the mine, and then troughs that would take the water all the way to the mine, and this water would then be used to turn giant water wheels. These water wheels were then used as hoist with the rope to hoist up the ore out of the mine. European legend said that gold follows the sun into the west. Explorers journeyed to the Americas not to settle, not to populate, but to collect gold for their European masters. Gold became one of the principal objectives for every one of the expeditions into the Americas, not only with the Spaniards early on, but later, the first English expeditions, for example, Jamestown. One of the first things the settlers of Jamestown were supposed to do was search for gold. For 6,000 years, from Bulgaria to Egypt to Germany, commoners had labored mightily to produce gold for their rulers. But as the 19th century dawned, Adventurers from around the globe would descend upon the new world in a frenzy of gold fever. Until 1799, gold mining was done in the name of king and country. It would take the freedom of the new world and an unlikely discovery to bring gold fever to the masses. Little Meadow Creek outside Charlotte, North Carolina. Here, a 12-year-old boy would ignite the world's first great gold rush. In 1799, on a Sunday, Conrad Reed was playing hooky from church. He went along Little Meadow Creek and he saw something that attracted his attention. He reached down and picked it up and he realized it was very unusual, very heavy took it back to the family, and nobody was able to recognize it as gold. They used it as a doorstop for three years. One of his neighbors suggested that Reed take this rock into Fayetteville with him, took it to a jeweler, and it was the jeweler that identified it as gold. 
Reed didn't really know what uh, the value of this thing was. Uh, the jeweler got away with giving him three dollars and fifty cents for this for this seventeen pound nugget of gold. With gold then worth fifteen dollars an ounce, John Reed had been swindled out of thirty six hundred dollars. Word spread like wildfire, and thousands of Welsh, Cornish, Germans, Austrians, and Poles flocked to the region. Within a decade, seven languages could be heard on the streets of Charlotte. By 1820, there were 300 gold mines in North Carolina. At first, prospectors used traditional methods called placer mining which relies on nature to do the heavy lifting. Instead of men digging underground, natural forces bring subterranean earth to the surface. Over millions of years, water flows erode mountains, exposing underground ores and depositing gold in streams. The miner merely searches the river and then separates out his treasure from sand and gravel. While prospectors are usually lucky to find tiny yellow flakes, the Reed Gold Mine property contained riches worthy of a pharaoh. Holes dug three to five feet deep, so-called placer pits, yielded astonishing finds. Along Little Meadow Creek, those pits became quite numerous as they dug up nuggets just like digging up potatoes. In one area, they found 155 and three quarter pounds of gold, every single nugget in excess of one pound each, in these placer pits. In 1825, the source of gold was traced to white milky quartz in the mountains above rivers. Southern miners quickly moved underground to exploit the find. They were largely individuals with little experience and few resources, and dug big holes without reinforcement, making cave-ins a constant threat. Charlotte established a pattern that would hold for future gold rushes. A lucky few hit the jackpot, while the vast majority struggled to survive. A miner's daily take might average $1, equivalent to $15 today. In 1829, gold was discovered in Dahlonega, Georgia, and soon after in Alabama and South Carolina. Nearly 1,000 mines dotted the southern landscape. In Georgia, the pay dirt lay beneath territory held by the Cherokee Nation. After the discovery of gold, the question for Georgians becomes, what are they going to do with the land? Or how are they going to distribute this land? Uh, the Cherokees are on it. They don't want to give it up. Georgia decided to raffle the land off in a lottery and prohibited the Indians from participating. The Cherokees won a legal victory in the US Supreme Court to keep their land. But President and Indian fighter Andrew Jackson refused to enforce the decision. In 1838, the U.S. Army forced the tribe 800 miles west across the infamous Trail of Tears. A decade later, gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill in Northern California, and the Southern Gold Rush would be forever dwarfed by the greatest human migration since the Crusades. People left farms, people left jobs, whole towns would vacate, they would turn themselves into a colony, and the men would go off. They came from China, Australia, Russia, and Brazil, braving an overland trek via the Oregon Trail, or an epic sea voyage around South America. They share dreams of a bountiful future and almost total ignorance of the task ahead. A whole party of Frenchmen came and they brought their wives. 
and they brought these huge rakes because they heard that there was gold in the river and all you had to do was get it out of the river, but they did not want to get wet. So they had manufactured these huge rakes which they intended to rake the river. There was even an advertisement that somebody had made up an ointment. If you could spread this ointment all over your body and then all you had to do was get to the top of the hill and roll down, you would actually collect gold all over your body and then you could scrape it off and you'd have all the gold you needed. People had no clue as to what it took to get gold and it was huge work. Labor in the diggings was backbreaking. You had to take advantage of certain times of the year when the flow of water had enough volume to wash the sands and gravels. This meant bent over next to a stream with ice cold water uh, for 12 hours or more a day. This meant shoveling huge mounds of uh, pay dirt for 12, 15 hours or more a day. Uh, many of these men ruined their health with this kind of uh, effort, day in and day out for three or four months in a row. The men used primitive techniques, only marginally improved since the time of the Egyptians. In 1848, prospector Ike Humphrey built the first cradle rocker, a simple contraption that was rocked back and forth with water to sift out sand from the heavier gold. Another tool was the sluice box, a rectangular wood trench designed for jets of water to be fed in from one end. Amid the turbulence, gold sinks to the bottom and is captured by cleats. These evolved into long toms, 12 to 18 foot long crates that require a powerful stream of water and several men to sift through great piles of pay dirt. A hundred thousand optimists had stampeded into California and within just two years, much of the surface gold was gone. In the years to come, the lone prospector with his pan would give way to large industrial mines and dangerous new technologies. The California gold rush was a frenzy to collect riches free for the taking. But after just two years, surface gold was all but exhausted. From 1851 onward, Western mining would be dominated by those with the financial resources to battle nature for every flake of gold. If you can dam the river and divert the river, then you have the, the whole stream bed to excavate, which is one of the first things that they did. And this was a very large operation to divert major streams, but they did it. Beginning in the 1850s, Hydraulic mining changed the California landscape. Water was collected through a series of ditches into a pipeline and then fired under tremendous pressure through a giant nozzle. So powerful that it could kill a man at 200 feet, the jet stream tore away hillsides in the hope of revealing underlying deposits. Hydraulic mining created huge, muddy messes that polluted downriver, spoiling drinking water and wreaking havoc with farm irrigation. Long stretches of hillside vanished. Although an effective form of collecting gold, in 1884, the destructive practice was banned in California. Throughout the American West, the future lay in hard rock mining. This meant searching for gold-bearing veins and breaking ore from deep within the granite core of mountains. It meant the industrialization of mines. 
big money, heavy labor, and massive machinery. In 1850, gold and silver were discovered at the Comstock Lode in the mountains of Nevada, setting the stage for revolutionary improvements in underground mining. Philip Deitersheimer, a mining engineer at the Comstock Lode, devised the first reliable means of supporting deep tunnels. Known as square-set timbering, the system of interlocking wood beams was so sturdy that the collapse of any one section would not trigger a domino effect. And this meant now the shafts could go much deeper, and they did on the Comstock Lode. They went down to uh, 1,000 feet, 1,200 feet, 1,500 feet. And after this, it was used throughout the West, in fact, throughout the world. Deitersheimer's ingenuity allowed Comstock miners to exploit the rich core of Mount Davidson. For 30 years, beginning in 1859, the Comstock produced $400 million in silver and gold. But yet again, more efficient mining meant environmental devastation. Square-set timbering devoured vast swaths of western trees. 80 million board feet of timber and lumber each year. Before long, the eastern slope of the Sierra Nevada was stripped bare for a stretch of 100 miles. Skilled miners from distant lands flocked to the American West, bringing with them a cacophony of languages. The deeper the mines went, the hotter they got. Shafts on the Comstock load regularly reached a blistering 125 degrees. As a result, miners received a daily allotment of 95 pounds of ice per man and were forced to take breaks every half hour. It was hellish work, not suited for everyone. No one knew their way around a mine better than the men of Cornwall, who had a long heritage of tin and coal mining. Their industriousness inspired the maxim that wherever there's a hole in the ground, you'll find a Cornishman at the bottom of it. Their lore showed a healthy respect for supernatural forces. Cornishmen could also be hard-headed scientists, and they pioneered the use of steam engines to pump water from mine shafts. In California and Nevada, the water table is between two and 300 feet deep, and any shaft below that encounters subterranean reservoirs. The Cornish pump could drain 18,000 gallons of water per hour, and operated on some mines 24 hours a day for decades. In the 1870s, a series of inventions greatly increased the efficiency of mining and the dangers. For thousands of years, gold seekers had used black powder to blast through to their treasure. The job of powder men paid relatively well, but it was also highly dangerous. Dynamite replaced black powder, quadrupling explosive power. With it came noxious fumes that could suffocate miners. And while dynamite is usually stable, when unexploded charges are placed in tightly drilled holes, removing them becomes a risky maneuver. In the 1880s, the invention of compressed air drills seemed like a godsend freeing miners from back-breaking manual drilling. But the new drills soon became known as widow-makers. As they cut into rock, they stirred up clouds of razor-sharp silica dust that caused the lung disease, silicosis.
Hundreds died before a safer water flush drill was introduced in the 1890s. Drilling deep shafts presented many complications and inspired bold solutions. At the Comstock load, an engineering marvel was devised that carried away excess water and toxic air. Adolf Sutro came up with an idea, a way to ventilate these deep shafts and a way to drain away water. And that was to tunnel into Mount Davidson from the side. This would mean tunneling almost five miles. It was something like finding a needle in the haystack to be able to hit these shafts from the side of the mountain. Nonetheless, Sutro did it, but it took him about a decade. Throughout the West, mines were becoming larger and more sophisticated. But on the eve of the 20th century, the last great gold rush would expose novice prospectors to some of nature's harshest conditions. The Yukon River in far western Canada is the fifth largest in North America. Among its many tributaries is the Klondike. Local Indians had long noticed yellow metal in streams and ignored it as useless to them. In 1896, news of a golden bonanza hit the front pages and the rush was on. The stampede into the Klondike in the late 1890s was the last chance for those who had missed the rush to California in 49, uh, the rush to Nevada in, in 59, the rush to Arizona in the early 80s. All these great, great rushes had, had come and gone. And now there was one last chance for those to take part in a great adventure. The Yukon had long, frigid winters, with temperatures plunging to 50 below. The Canadian Mounties required anyone entering the gold fields to carry a ton of supplies, enough to give them a fighting chance of survival. At Chilkoot Pass, a never-ending stream of pack-laden men made four trips a day for 10 days, just for their personal gear. Remarkably, some would also transport machinery weighing many thousands of pounds. There were large circular dredges with a series of rotating buckets to scoop out dirt for treatment. They had to be disassembled, hauled in pieces up mountains and over rapids, and reassembled on site. It's amazing, even today there are dredges left from the, that era and to see them in the middle of nowhere and the massive size and scale of these things, it's hard to conceive that these people were able to put these things there. For most of the year, the ground was frozen. Thawing even small sections of earth was an arduous and tedious process. The men would try to dig and build fires. They would try to direct uh, jets of steam into the ground, into the ice, to thaw it out, because waiting for them was millions of dollars of pay dirt. From 1899 to 1904, the Klondike produced $100 million in gold. As in California, the easy gold went quickly, and only a fortunate few struck it rich. Most considered themselves lucky simply to survive and to have shared a grand adventure. Poet Robert Service crystallized the spirit of the Yukon. You may recall in savage splendor that land that measures each man at his worth and feel in memory, half fierce, half tender, the brotherhood of men that knew the North.
the romance of the Yukon drew a new generation of entrepreneurs and engineers to the gold fields of Alaska. These professionals would pioneer techniques that revolutionized hard rock mining. Alaskan ore is extremely low grade, with small deposits of gold spread over large areas. To be profitable, it must be collected and processed on an immense scale. By 1910, the Alaska Juno mine was detonating 750 cases of dynamite at a time, breaking off millions of tons of rock in a single blast. Blessed with economy of scale, the mine prospered while recovering just one ounce of gold for every 22 tons of rock processed. Gold is not found in big nuggets or big chunks. Most people, if they were given a piece of ore, gold ore, would not have the slightest idea there's any gold in it. A miner can work his whole life and not see a fleck of gold. Once collected, the ore went through a multi-stage refining process. First, slabs of rock were crushed into manageable chunks. Then great stamps, weighing up to 1,200 pounds apiece, pulverized the stones as fine as table salt. The powdered ore was mixed with water and fed downhill to amalgamation tables, where it was sprinkled with chemicals. First mercury, later cyanide, that act to separate out the gold. Scale was of great importance. Economy of scale and, and profitably operating these gold mines. Treadwell had 960 stamps pounding away 363 days a year. The biggest stamp mill ever built in the history of mining, and these were used throughout the world at this point in time. Stamp mills generated a tremendous roar that could be heard a mile away. They operated round the clock and depended on cheap, reliable sources of power. A series of hydroelectric plants were constructed, and the heavy rains of southeast Alaska put to work. The hydroelectric dam at Annex Creek drew its water from a unique source, a tunnel driven beneath the bottom of the lake. This tunnel went back 1,500 feet and then up 80 feet to the bottom of the lake, which happens to be 150 feet below the surface of the water. They blasted a hole through the bottom of this lake and the water would literally flow out the bottom like a bathtub. It would go down this drain, which in this case was a tunnel, then into a pipeline two and a half miles down to Tidewater, where the power plant was. With their large-scale machinery and inventive technology, the Alaskan mines were precursors to the modern era of gold mining. In the 1970s, rising gold prices would bring forth gigantic new mines that pushed the limits of man and nature. For much of the 20th century, the value of gold was fixed at $35 an ounce. In 1968, the United States deregulated the price and gold skyrocketed. Contemporary prices of roughly $300 an ounce have inspired immensely ambitious and expensive new mines. In the American West, mountains are moved and landscapes obliterated to make way for vast open pit mines. Some of these pits are two miles long and a mile wide. I mean, they're, they're, they're massive. 
the, the scale of these pits are, are extremely impressive and they're, they're very deep, you know, six, seven hundred feet deep in some of them. And you see these huge haul trucks where the, the tires on them are, say, 12 feet in diameter and you look at them in the bottom of the pit when you're standing at the top and they look like little toy trucks coming up the spiral road, hauling the ore up to the surface. After great loads are collected from the pits, cyanide is sprinkled over rocks to efficiently dissolve out microscopic flecks of gold. Cyanide can contaminate surrounding soil, and so its residue is stored in special wells lined with protective plastic. These containers are closely monitored for signs of leakage. Open pits typically yield one ounce of gold from 40 tons of rock, enough to turn a profit at current prices. Modern mines are essentially giant assembly lines that must maintain balanced operation. A mine that produces more ore than could be transported or processed is needlessly wasteful. Computer simulations of changing scenarios, adding a truck here, subtracting 50 miners there, ensure that resources are allotted with maximum efficiency. The Lehair mine, which is a new gold mine located on an island near Papua New Guinea, was the first mine in the world to be totally designed via a computer simulation and animation model. The model was used for more than 150 of the what-if scenarios that the engineers were able to pose. They did this back in Bristol, England, for the mine that was halfway around the world near Papua New Guinea. Building a modern mine requires years of analysis, planning, and drilling, and costs between $200 million and $1 billion before realizing any income. Exploration geologists are under intense pressure to locate rich areas that will eventually pay off. For underground sites, the most reliable guides are diamond drills that can recover core samples from thousands of feet below the surface. deepest and richest gold mines in the world today are the South African mines. More than two miles deep, their construction demands a mix of meticulous instrumentation and brute force. During one of my trips underground in South Africa, we walked for a mile or two looking at everything and I looked up and saw a sign hanging over the top of the drift. You are now leaving South Africa. We were entering another country deep underground. The surveyors were so exact, they were able to spot the exact inch where you're leaving the country. At the beginning of each eight-hour shift, groups of 150 miners reach the bottom after a swift 10-minute plunge. The elevator runs constantly until perhaps 2,000 men have entered an alien land. South African mines are a study in contrast. Ultra-modern technology constructs them, and traditional back-breaking labor keeps them running. Giant air conditioning systems on the surface cool water, which is then pumped into the mine to reduce air temperature. Once heated, the water is brought back out again, and the process is repeated. The air conditioning system of a single mine could cool a city of 100,000 people. Miners receive special training in walking, crawling, and drilling in claustrophobic conditions. They hail from a variety of African tribes with different languages, 
and rely on universal visual signals developed especially for underground mines. There are even light signals that, that don't require words or enunciation. For example, the, the twisting of the head and rotating is no. And a lot of it is, if you twist a lot, it means there's danger. Spontaneous rock bursts are considered a kind of mini earthquake. And a single mine typically registers 700 such seismic events each month. After dynamite blasts have altered the stress levels, rocks will explode with body-piercing force. Combustible methane gas, a traditional mining hazard, can occur in deep mines. In response to recent accidents, naked flames have been banned underground. The gold mine where I worked had a methane explosion due to the mixture of air and methane and a, a light. Um, this methane explosion uh, killed um, nine miners underground. Research is now underway to determine if even deeper gold mines are feasible. Oil wells have been dug as deep as five miles. The question is whether humans can survive and work at such depths. If so-called ultra-deep mines are built, they will likely be manned by robot miners. In a world of change and uncertainty, gold is eternal. The history of human migration is in large part the history of gold's unique lure. Today, there is less gold per person than ever before, and it is increasingly difficult to find. But if the past is prelude, future gold seekers will discover ingenious new ways to pursue an ancient passion.